Good morning. It's on the, on the screen as well if you want to follow it. The parable of the persistent widow. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and never give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally the judge said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Thank you, Carl. I should have a PowerPoint hiding there somewhere. Obviously, that's a painting done by one of the Grand Masters, as you can see. Today, as we continue looking at the stories that Jesus told, we come to the story of what I'm calling the widow and the judge. This isn't the first time I've preached from this passage, which always presents a bit of a challenge especially as one of the previous times I've preached on this passage was here at New Life Baptist Church. Now, I'm not a big fan of just dusting off a sermon, an old sermon. To me, it feels a little bit like cheating, although there are times when it will be the right thing to do. So when I was sat at home looking at this passage again, reading around it, my challenge was to try to approach the passage in a slightly different way and bring out elements of the story that sometimes get lost in the mix. Right at the beginning, Luke sets the scene, telling us that Jesus is telling his disciples a parable about why they should always pray and not give up. The story that Jesus then tells them is very short and on the face of it, pretty simple. It would be easy to read the passage and think, that's it then. I must keep on praying and not stop. But as always, there's more going on than meets the eye. And we only really see that when we dig a bit deeper. In the time that Jesus had been with his disciples, he'd already given them plenty of examples of the importance of prayer. And they would have seen how often he went off by himself to pray. At their request, he taught them how they should pray in the words of what we know as the Lord's Prayer they would have been in no doubt of the need to pray. And although he may well have been reminding them not to stop praying, what he really wanted them to understand was this. He wanted them to understand the character of who they were praying to and the need for them to be patient. Now, Jesus will quite often use dramatic examples to point people to the truth. And this story is certainly one of those. Although it, it might not be quite so obvious if we don't quite get the context. 
So to begin with, we're introduced to the principal characters of the story, a judge and a widow. We know next to nothing about either of them, apart from being the, told the judge has no fear of God. He doesn't care what people think. And then we know that this widow has been seeking justice time and time again from this same judge to no avail. But what the story can't really convey to us is how awful the plight of widows would have been back then, or even what was expected of a judge. The picture we may have of a judge in our modern society and also a widow is very different to the culture and the practices of the people of Jesus' day. And so it helps us to hear the story as they would have heard it. Now, widows would have been easily recognised back then. They would have worn distinctive clothing which would have symbolised their status. We read that in Genesis. We also read it in books of what are called the Apocrypha. Jewish women would have been married very often in their very early teens. Because of this and the mortality rates then, widows were numerous and not necessarily very old. They were often left with no means of support. If her husband left an estate, she did not inherit it, although provision for her upkeep would be made. If she remained in her husband's family, she would find herself in an inferior, almost servile position. And if she returned to her own family, any money exchanged at the wedding had to be given back. It was not uncommon for widows then to be victimised and even to find themselves being sold into slavery in lieu of a debt. And that may sound really hard to believe, but the writer of Lamentations writes of widows being sold into slavery. Now, unlike the legal system of today, we don't know much about the system of Jesus' day. But we do know what should have been expected of a judge. Under Old Testament law, judges were expected to fear God. Bear in mind, he will judge those who break his law and mistreat others. And they were there to defend the oppressed. There were penalties in place for unjust judges, but in fairness, they more often than not got away with corruption. Legal cases that involved pro property invariably um, required three judges, whereas only one was needed when the issue was something to do with money. Elsewhere in the Gospels, the writers talk about people appearing in front of one judge and the possibility of being sent to prison if they didn't pay what they owed. So perhaps that's what this widow's case was about. Perhaps it was about money. To be honest, it doesn't really matter. But what, we, what matters is how, that we understand how desperate the plight, the situation of a widow could be, and how unsympathetic the legal system was. And when we bear in mind that we've been told that this judge had no fear of God, that she'd appealed to him many times before, I think we can take it as rest, read. He didn't care about her case. He was probably corrupt. And there's a very good chance he was both. Now, we don't know how many times she'd appeared before him. But all we're told is that on this occasion, he decided to grant whatever her request was. He didn't do it because justice mattered. He just wanted a quiet life. He wanted her to stop hassling him. 
I would imagine this widow had probably expected the same treatment that she'd already had at his hands for her plea to just fall on deaf ears. So she must have been properly surprised at his change of heart. I doubt she cared what his reasons were. What mattered was that her patience had been rewarded. And it's her example of patience that Jesus holds up as an example of how we need to be. And I got to thinking about patience. And as I did, I came across this story that, i got to be honest, made me chuckle. A lonely man decided that life would be more fun if he had a pet. So off he went to the local pet shop and he told the owner that he wanted to buy an unusual pet. After some discussion, he decided on a centipede. Not necessarily that one. It came in a little white box to use as its house. He took the centipede home, found a good location for the box, and then he decided he would start off by taking his new pet to a restaurant to have dinner, like you do. So he asked the centipede in the box, would you like to go out with me and have dinner? There was no answer from his new pet. This bothered him a bit. But he waited a few minutes and then asked him again, how about going out for a meal with me? Silence. There was no answer from his new friend and pet. So he waited a few more minutes, thinking about the situation. He decided to ask him one more time, this time putting his face against the centipede's house and shouting, hey in there, would you like to go with me and have dinner? A little voice came out of the box from the centipede. Be patient. I heard you the first time. I'm putting my shoes on. <laughs> Must admit, it made me laugh when I read it. Patience. It's something that many of us have trouble with. I've shared with you before my lack of patience for other motorists, most of whom I think should park their cars and walk. <coughs> I'm also not very good with inanimate objects, such as tools, when they don't do what they were invented to do. I can see my wife nodding. I'm sure she can give some other examples. And yet getting impatient with these things, it doesn't make it better, it doesn't make it any easier. And to be honest, it often makes it a lot worse. That's why the Bible tells us it's important to be patient. Patient with one another. Patient with situations. Even patient with what's going on in our world. And of course, patient when it comes to prayer. God wants us to pray and not give up. Jesus taught us to pray. But at no time are we ever told how or when our prayers will be answered. Only that God is listening and that he will answer. And that's why Jesus used this story to show how important patience is. God is still at work. He hasn't finished yet. He's not retired. He's working and active in our world. He's working in our lives. Sometimes he's testing us. Sometimes he's making us think through issues. And sometimes that's not easy. Sometimes it's tough to hold on to that belief, that faith. We've waited, we've hoped, and we've prayed, and things haven't changed. They're still the same. 
A house move we thought was meant to be has fallen through. A loved one or a friend hasn't got better. The difficult situation we're in is still the same. But just because things don't change or happen as we would like them, it doesn't mean that God has stopped working. I know, as I've already said, that can be hard to hold on to, but it's still true. In his second letter, Peter tells us a thousand years are like a day for God. But sometimes we want God to act right here, right now. But patience, if we let it, teaches us to wait and remember that God is still in charge. God has it. Easy for me to say, I know. But I also know that it's not so easy to put it into practice. Where do we go to find this elusive quality? Patience, it's a hard thing to create. It's near impossible for us to make ourselves patient. We can't produce that quality on our own, but luckily we don't have to. As we grow in our Christian faith, as we learn to trust more and more that God really is in charge of the world and of our lives, then patience grows as a natural result of our relationship with God. God's spirit makes us patient, writes Paul in his letter to the Galatians. Patience is one of the fruits of the spirit and it's a fruit that God will grow in us as we grow in him. It's not something that happens overnight but again, as we learn to trust him, as we learn to rely on him, it will come. Patience was something that I had to learn on my journey into the ministry. At one point, I know I've sort of shared it before with you, I got very frustrated with how long the process was taking. And then God stepped in and told me to be patient and just go with it. I did as he asked and all my frustration went. And as I learnt in that situation, probably the most important step in developing patience is to give God control of our lives, to let go that certainly worked for me, and it was a reality for David when he reflected on how God had helped him in times of trouble. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. We may still struggle with patience in some situations, but that's because God's work in us it's not finished. Who knows? Perhaps I could become more patient with other motorists if I asked God to be my co-driver. I'm sure Julie would probably say no way. But... <laughs> and then we come back to the judge. Now, for those of you sitting here this morning who are students of rabbinic literature, you may well be aware that Jesus' story is a formal argument known as Karl the Homer. Now, for those of us who aren't quite so widely read, that's me included, what that means is this story is a standard Jewish how much more argument. If an unjust judge who doesn't care about the plight of a widow can dispense justice, how much more will the judge of all the earth 
who was known as a defender of widows and orphans, do so. That's the contrast that Jesus wanted to get across. The judge of all the earth is, of course, God. He's nothing like the judge in the story because he's a loving father. He was attentive to our every cry, generous in his gifts, concerned about our needs and ready to answer when we call. We have assurance after assurance in the Bible that God will answer our prayers. Jesus tells us, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. In the Psalms we are told, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The message puts it like this. So what makes you think God won't step in and work justice for his chosen people who continue to cry out for help? Won't he stick up for them? I assure you he will. He will not drag his feet. Even though it can be hard to hold on to these truths, there is no doubt that God will hear and will answer. In John's first letter, he says these words about prayer. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. There is, however, a very important point here. One word that we need to lash on to. Our praying must be according to God's will. How do we do that? How do we make sure our praying is in line with the will of God? Well, one way is to, is to model our prayer on the example that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. We can do it by looking at the examples of godly biblical characters. And of course, we can do it by examining our own motives for what we pray for. God, the judge of all the earth, is our heavenly father who loves us, treasures us and tells us clearly to come to him. He will not deal with us like the unjust judge. He will respond, he will answer, but we may well need to be patient. That's the real point of Jesus's story. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for another example in the stories that you told your disciples. And thank you, those stories are timeless. They are dressed just as true for us today as they were back then. Of course, Lord, you call us to pray and not give up. But Lord, that story reminds us of who we are praying to and the fact that we need to wait on you. That's not always easy, Lord. But I pray that you would give us that ability. Thank you that we can bring all to you. Thank you that we know you hear. We know you listen. And thank you that you say you will answer. Help us to be willing and able to wait for those answers. Thank you, Lord.